Uh, in any case, um, uh, the the it, it, the sign of a, of a of a good book project is where you 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 start investigating a subject and the bottom just falls out. You know, I I there was far more uh, information than I could fit in the book, uh, and uh, that's a good thing. So that means that you just you can just pick the the, the stories and the examples that really uh, really get your point across. Um, the book originally came out in um, 2000, paper, paperback came out in 2001. Um, and, you know, the frustrating, I've written a number of other books since then, and every time the frustrating thing about writing a book is that, you know, as soon as, um, as soon as it's at the printer, practically, uh, there's new science coming out. You know, I always wish that, like, scientists would understand that I'm writing about them and they need to just put a moratorium for maybe two, three years <laughs> so that my book would be relevant. And then they can start publishing again and then I would be obsolete. But you know, they, they don't they're 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 rude and <laughs> keep doing their science and they keep coming up with new things. So so for example, a few years after I wrote the book I was at Johns Hopkins and there was a the guy I was talking to giving a talk and afterwards I talked to a guy who said malaria and uh, I'd been talking about wasps. Like, you know, there was a really interesting wasp um, I saw when I was in, I think he was in Malawi. He saw this wasp walking across the road, pulling on a cockroach with its in, by its antenna, kind of like a dog pulling on a leash. And it's like, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. And he's like, no, no, actually, I, I, I actually eventually got in touch with a biologist in Israel who studies these things. I, this is what they do. Like, no. <laughs> no, trust me. I read a book about these things. <laughs> the, no, no, they can't, that cannot be. They, that sounds crazy. So he said, no, no, talk to this guy. Um, so his name is Fred Lieberstadt. Um, and there it is. The, this is the, it is called Ampulex Compressa, uh, the emerald, I think it's called the emerald green cockroach wasp. And here it is. And, it's actually freakier than anything I wrote about in the book. So what it does is, uh, the first thing it does is that it, it buzzes around. It's in the Near East, it's in Africa. It buzzes around and looks for a cockroach. Cockroach, cockroach, cockroach. Okay, finds a cockroach, lands, and basically gets into this, this fight with the cockroach. This is like in the middle of one of these battles. Um, you know, the cockroach, you know, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's not going to go down easily. But what the, what, so what the wasp does is it delivers a sting into the cockroach's <coughs> abdomen, which paralyzes it. Now it's not permanently paralyzed. It's just paralyzed long enough so that the wasp can now deliver a second shot. And what it does with its stinger, so this is, this is a stinger that delivers drugs, delivers pharmaceuticals, you know. Uh, uh, it go. It takes the stinger and it, it sticks it into the cockroach's head, and it wends its way around to a particular spot in the cockroach's brain. Cockroaches do have brains, small one. But in any case, it goes to a particular spot that governs voluntary movements, and then it releases uh, uh, certain compounds that are very similar to the cockroach's own neurotransmitters. That's finishes the brain surgery, pulls out its stinger, and the cockroach now recovers from that first shot. So it's no longer paralyzed, but it has lost the will to move. And so basically what the wasp then does is it pulls the cockroach and leads it down into a burrow that it has dug out. And it lays an egg on the underside of the wasp, uh, on the underside of the, underside of the cockroach. And the wasp crawls out and seals off the burrow. The cockroach is like, okay, what's next? <laughs> what's next is that the egg hatches, it crawls inside, it grows, and it actually doesn't leave to form a pupa, it actually forms a pupa inside. It develops in there, and then this is what happens next. <laughs> so, I, you know, uh, it's very humbling when you write a whole book about parasites and you didn't even have a clue about some of the most awesome things out there. Um, 
you know, one of the things, so scientists uh, since then have been doing a lot of other kinds of research, more sophisticated work, to try to explain these things. So um, it seems that uh, uh, it, they're, they're getting really interested in how parasites rewire the brains of their hosts. Very sophisticated ways that they use these things. This is actually a different parasite um, that infects uh, invertebrates in, in water. And this is a picture of the brain staining for uh, a neurotransmitter called serotonin. And you can see how the connections have been radically changed by the parasite there. Um, another parasite they're studying along these lines is this horrendous thing called a hairworm. Again, didn't write about the book. <laughs> so the hairworm will infect uh, crickets uh, in, here in the US, in Europe. Um, and the thing is that these, these hairworms, they mate in streams. Crickets don't live in streams. So how is that hairworm going to get to the stream? Well, what it does is it forces the cricket to basically get suicidal. The cricket just jumps around like crazy and basically races around until it finds water and jumps in and drowns. And this is a picture of a hairworm emerging from uh, its host in the water. Um, so how, how does that cricket go berserk? Well, there are all sorts of sophisticated uh, ways in which the parasite turns on and off genes in the cricket's own neurons. So it's, it's, it's getting into the, into the very DNA of its host and switching genes on and off to manipulate how it behaves. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things about, um, about uh, parasites that's been developing recently is that it's starting to bleed into medicine. You know, how, how uh, you know, we get infected with lots of parasites. And by parasite, I mean anything that lives inside of you at your expense. Um, and are they manipulating us? So when we sneeze, when we have the flu or a cold, I mean, we're spewing viruses. So is that the virus using us? It's a hard kind of question to, to, to tell and, and because we have to test different possibilities. Uh, one, one really interesting study that, that people have been doing in the past few years is figuring out um, the what the parasite that causes malaria does. Uh, so it turns out that mosquitoes um, that get infected with plasmodium <coughs> causes malaria, things that give us malaria, they actually uh, become more eager to bite us when the parasite is ready to get into us. So eager, in fact, that you know, they're more likely to get killed um, because we're going to smack them. But that parasite is ready to get into its human host. So parasite manipulation, <coughs> host manipulation, is not just some science fiction thing. It's part of how millions, hundreds of millions of people get sick every year with a disease that kills about 800,000 people a year. Uh, and this is a study that came out which actually shows that we, when, when the parasite inside of us is ready to get out into another mosquito, we become more attractive to mosquitoes. We give off some attractive smell so that people, so that <coughs> the mosquitoes will actually come to us. Um, so it may be that the parasite is releasing some sort of odor through our skin, or maybe it's causing us to produce some sort of fragrance mosquitoes like. Nobody knows. 